How you doing, Rock? Everyone good? Everyone good? Again, my name is Sean Patterson, and I'm a community group leader here uh, at The Rock, and listen, I'm honored to stand before you. Any opportunity I get to do it, no matter what the forum is, right, whether we're out on the lawn or we're in a mostly empty auditorium, you know, whatever it is, uh, I'm honored to share with you guys. So I just want to start, if you don't mind, with a story that I just recently heard that I believe um, kind of sets the tone for I want to communicate this morning. Uh, there was a busy father who was looking for a way to entertain his young daughter. And so as he was flipping the pages of his magazine, uh, he found in the magazine a, a map of the world. And so he decided to rip it out of the magazine and he cut it up in pieces and he slid it over to his young child uh, and suggested that she put it together. Well, in relatively short order, she put it all together. It was perfectly ordered, perfectly put together. And now he's confused, like, man, I don't even know if I could have done that. Like, how, how did she do that so fast? And so he asked her, he said, how did you do that so quickly? And this is what she said to him. She said, well, Dad, uh, when you ripped the page out of the magazine, I saw on the back of the map of the world that you gave me, I saw a picture of a man and a woman. And so I thought to myself, if I can just put the man and the woman back together, I could put the world back together. Guys, this is, in a nutshell, what God is doing on the earth. If God can put man and woman back together, he can put the world back together. Uh, we are in a series that we've been calling A View from the Rock, and you know, we just figured this is a, a good a time as any uh, for us to discuss who we are um, as a people, as a group, as, as a body uh, of believers here at The Rock, and the ways in which God is putting us back together so that he can ultimately use us to do the same in the world around us. You know, this is a ministry, The Rock of Roseville, uh, that disciples leaders that transform culture. All right, and, and we value all things that pertain to the DNA of discipleship, which is identity, community, and mission. All right, th these are the very things, identity, community, and mission. These are the very things um, that we all need in order to thrive as the people of God in a fallen world. And it's really interesting, you got to note this, that, that identity, community, and mission, they're, they're not just cute words that we plucked out of the sky and, you know, phrases that we just grabbed because they look good on paper. No, no, you see this pattern all throughout Scripture. All right, let me prove it to you. Uh, early, uh, as Jesus is beginning his public ministry and as he was recruiting people uh, to serve alongside of him, uh, Jesus walks up to a group of fishermen, and this is what he says. He says, follow me, community, and I will make you identity. Fishers of men, mission. At the end of his earthly ministry, after Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the grave, he's about to ascend to heaven. The last thing that Jesus says to his disciples is this. He says, go and make disciples of every nation, mission. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, identity. Teaching them to obey all the things I've commanded you, community. You even see this further into the New Testament as Peter begins, a disciple of Jesus, he begins to write letters to churches. And, and, and so Peter pins this letter uh, to Christians who are struggling and scattered all throughout uh, Rome and Asia Minor. Uh, and this is what Peter says to him in this letter. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession, identity. That you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Mission. And then he says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Community. And so over and over again, you see this pattern in scripture as the way in which God saves us, sanctifies us, and uses us as a means to fulfill his purpose. He's putting us back together. So that he can ultimately put the world back together. That's what he's doing. And so every week we've been looking at uh, one of these values together. I believe last week Pastor Mark absolutely slayed it. He was amazing. Uh, in, in the hip-hop culture, if you have really good lyrics, 
we say, you know, that, that dude's got bars, okay? <laughs> Pastor Mark has bars, okay? He was great, great. And so he hit on community last week. And so what I just want to do uh, is I just want to camp there a little bit longer. Let's talk about community a little bit more. Amen? Let me pray. Father, I just thank you for being our God. Hmm. Lord, all is for your glory. All is for your glory. Lord God, uh, we just thank you for the opportunity that we get to walk with you, to know you. Lord, I, I'm reminded of, of the day that I gave my life to you. I, I just remember I wasn't looking for you. I wasn't um, in pursuit in any way. But you, you snatched me up, as it were. Lord God, you chased me down. And I just thank you, Lord God. This is a very unlikely relationship. <laughs> But I thank you that you are a God who pursues. You are a God who loves, who heals. You are a God who comes for us. And so I just think about anyone who's at home right now and they're watching, or maybe it was unlikely that they even logged in. It was unlikely that they even tapped and started hearing the volume play as they were scrolling. Very unlikely, but here they are. And so I thank you, God, that that though there may be those who are at home and maybe they're isolated, maybe um, they're struggling right now, I thank you, God, for the invitation into community uh, that you are casting right now, Lord. And so we just, we present this service to you, Lord. We ask that you would show up and show up strong in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 So in, in my preparation for today, uh, I, I've been gripped by a passage in scripture that I've been reading. So I just want to share this with you. Uh, Jesus uh, is saying this. He, it's actually a prayer of Jesus towards the end of his, his earthly ministry. And uh, this is what he says. John uh, chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus prays this. He says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. And so what Jesus is communicating here is that the number one way that the, the, the number one tool that he's given us to show the world who he is is the beauty and the depth of our love for one another. See, uh, from all eternity, in the beginning, before the beginning, God existed in the form of community as understood by us as the Trinity. God existed that way. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit has always been deferring to one another, honoring one another, loving one another. And so what that means is that that community was not created. It's always been. I mean, you see this almost immediately in the book of Genesis when Adam is created. God creates Adam, and, and, and you see that before sin entered into the world, before there was anything wrong with the world, Adam was lonely. And it's the, it's the one thing that God said pre-fall. It is the one thing that God looked at and said, man, this is not good. It's the one thing. See, Adam was not lonely because he was imperfect. Now watch this. Adam was not lonely because he was imperfect. Adam was lonely because he was perfect. See, loneliness is the one problem you and I have in our lives because we were made in the, in the image of a triune God. It's the one problem that we have. All of your other problems rise out of sin. Your anger, your tantrums, your envy, right, right, your like everything else rises out of sin. And so to, to, to quote, you know, the great poet Jay-Z, you know, you may have 99 problems, but loneliness ain't one, okay? You may have 99 sin problems, but loneliness ain't one. All right, so let me just sum this up to you in, in a tweetable phrase, okay? Let me just sum this up for you. Now, and this is a hot take, but I, I do believe it firmly. All right, the less you need community, the less you need community, the less you are like God. The less you need community, the less you are like. I mean, th there's a reason why solitary confinement is used as a means of torture. It's not good for us. It's, it's not good for us. The less you need community, the less you are like God. All right. And so why am I hitting this so hard? Because there, th there is a cultural sway that seeks to reduce our relationships to these superficial surface externalities. It, it, it just does. Like, like, like Adam and Eve. Think about them. Adam needed Eve, even when he had a relationship with God. 
even when he was living in paradise. Many of us think that, man, if I could just get away and be, no, no, no. Adam was in paradise and he needed a friend. He needed community. And it was sin that caused them to use fig leaves and to hide themselves, right? You remember the story. Adam and Eve, uh, they took the forbidden fruit, they ate it, and all of a sudden their eyes were open and they began to see each other's nakedness. And so they, they cut out fig leaves and they covered themselves up. And I'm just going to tell you, we've been hiding ourselves from each other. We've been covering ourselves up from each other from then on. Social media, not now. I know I need to watch out. A lot of you are viewing me from social media, all right? So I know I may be kind of demonizing an idol, but, but just think about this for a minute. Social media, uh, the gram, Snapchat, Facebook, these are modern-day fig leaves. How, you say? Because it's, it's on these platforms that we can give each other measured access to one another, cropped and edited versions of ourselves, Right. But not the real you. Oh, no, not the real you. See, social media, for, for all its promises to connect people, is actually feeding our loneliness and individualism. There's a term for this. It's called elective identity. I give you the parts of me that I want you to see. You give me parts of you that you only want me to see. And we do this over and over and over again. And because none of us can actually bear up under the weight and the freight of who we're telling people we are, we just continue to hide. And this gets reinforced every day, every day, sometimes every hour. And, and, and so with each status update, with each post, with each uh, pose, perfect pose and perfectly filtered picture, with each one, we keep community at bay. I mean, am I the only one who, like, I'm, when, I, when I spend time with friends and family and, and my children, you know, when I'm hanging out and I'm at a beach or I'm on vacation, am I the only one who, I'm in these beautiful places and I find myself scrolling? And we don't have no one in here, no one, like, no response in this room. Like, am I, am I the only one? Like, 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 I find myself being more committed to making sure that everyone sees that I'm having an awesome time than actually making sure I'm having an awesome time, <laughs> right? Like, I, like I, I find myself having a great time with family and friends and then later on being so upset, so disappointed in myself because I didn't capture a picture to post it. Like, like what's wrong with us? What's wrong? What, I guess it's just me because everyone in here is looking at me like I'm speaking a different language. Yeah, it's, I know it's Mark. I know it's Mark. What's Facebook? Yeah, what's Facebook? Let's move on. So to truly see community, to truly see community, we must truly see each other. Uh, Pastor Mark, last week, he uh, used this building um, as a means to explain to us how we as a whole are greater than the sum of our parts, right? And so I want to try to one-up him if I can, All right? So, so... So, so just think about with me, just think about the sun. Okay. The sun is 93 million miles away from us. Uh, and yet we feel it, right? We, we can see it in the sky, right? We're, we're impacted by it. Our, our very lives are dependent upon the sun, isn't it? And if you ever try looking directly at the sun, you naturally squint, right? And the reason why is because the UV light that comes from the sun if you're not careful, even though the sun is 93 million miles away, if you are not careful and you try to look at the sun, the UV light can burn out your retinas. Like it's that powerful. And so the only, and, and then you, you, you still haven't actually seen the sun, by the way, right? And so the only way you can actually really see the sun is through a filter. The only way you can truly observe it, study it, see it is through a filter. See, God the Father is likened to the sun. He is so holy. He is so high. He, he is so high, but yet, at the same time, he's so near. His existence is undeniable. Our very lives are dependent upon him. Yet, the only way to see him is through a filter. Jesus is that filter. Jesus is the filter. Uh, by becoming a man and, and living among us, we're able to see what God is like. But that's not the case when it comes to each other. All right, so... Uh, 
though we grow in God and we know God through the filter that is Jesus, uh, there, there is a way in which God grows us in community and among each other that can only be accomplished. It can only be accomplished if we are living among one another unfiltered. And so th- this is what I'm trying to say, is that there can be no supernatural character change without real, true, deep involvement in community. Can be. And so I, I just gave you a major data dump. Okay, I just threw the kitchen sink at you. And, and, I, and I think we spend a lot of time around here talking about why we need community. And so what I want to do for just the, the, the few minutes that I have left with you, I, I just want to take for granted right now that we're all in agreement. Okay, I, I want to assume that we all know that we need community. And the disconnect then is how do we actually do it? Like, like maybe you're watching and maybe you're saying to yourself, man, Sean, I, I know I need closeness with others. I, I know that I need friendships. I know that I need to live unfiltered. But how do I actually do it? How do I do it? I think we get a, a good glimpse of the how-to of community by looking at the friendship between David and Jonathan in Scripture. Now, we all know the story of David and Goliath um, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. But what happens almost immediately after um, is this really interesting friendship that forms between David and Jonathan. So 1 Samuel chapter 18 through 1 Samuel chapter 23, there's this really, really cool friendship that forms. Uh, Eugene Peterson, he wrote a, a commentary on 1 Samuel, and he observed that in chapter 18, David and Jonathan made a covenant with one another. And in chapter uh, 23, David and Jonathan made a covenant with one another. And so what he says is, these are the most dangerous and vulnerable times in David's life. And yet, Jonathan's relationship with David brackets the evil. And and what I think he's saying here is that that Jonathan's relationship with David contains the evil. That that the only reason why David survived was because of his friendship with Jonathan. It was the only way he made it out of that season of life. All right? Jonathan shows us, when you read those chapters, chapter 18 through 23, and it's it's actually a pretty long story arc. um, So I won't I'll spare you reading the whole thing. But when you look at the story, you read the story, what you find is that uh, Jonathan is showing us that rich community requires two things. It requires acceptance and loyalty. Acceptance and loyalty. Friends always let you in, acceptance. And friends never let you down, loyalty. All right, so let's look at these two for, for just the last few minutes we have together. First, acceptance. A good twofold definition for acceptance is the belief in the goodness of something and the receipt of something good. And so when we let one another pass the veil, when we see the unfiltered areas of each other's lives and community, we believe for one another and we receive from one another. Okay, We believe for one another, for, uh, for one another and we receive from one another. And in 1 Samuel 18, Jonathan perceives that God has anointed David to become king after his father, Saul. Now, Jonathan is the heir to the throne. He's supposed to be the next king. But it it seemed very clear that David was going to take his father's place. But then it says that Jonathan's soul was knit to David and that he loved him as he loved himself, which means that there was no ill will. Matter of fact, Jonathan took off his, his, his cloak. He took off his, all his armor, his sword. He gave everything to David. Now, Saul, Jonathan's father, perceived the same thing. And he knew that David was going to become the next king, but it made him murderously jealous. It made him very, very envious. And so I want you to think about this from Jonathan's perspective. I want us to get into his shoes for a moment. Think about this. David was going to take the throne from him. David was a better warrior than him. He was more popular than him. He lived in his house. He was married to his sister. His dad hated his guts. And yet, Jonathan loved him and wanted to see him thrive. Think about that. Which is evidenced by the fact that if you read chapter 18 through 23, you see that it's a full-time job on the part of Jonathan to protect David from his father, who's always trying to kill him. Right? Right? And so Jonathan, uh, the only way he could have done that was that he believed in the goodness of David. He believed in the goodness of David. You know, a a couple weeks ago, I was 
I was really bummed out about the death of Chadwick Boseman. And so I, I threw on the, the movie Black Panther and I was watching it and there's a scene in the movie um, and, and this is a good scene. I know we all remember, if you've seen the movie, you, you remember seeing this. It was a really good scene. It's actually the kind of that epic uh, boss scene where the hero is fighting the villain. It's towards the end of the movie. You know someone's going to die. Well, they're fighting, and uh, Black Panther, uh, King T'Challa, he uh, stabs Killmonger in the chest. And at this point, they both know the fight is over. They know Killmonger, he's done. He's going to die. And so because they know it's over, they just start to have a conversation. And uh, King T'Challa, Black Panther, he, he takes Killmonger up on a mountain, uh, the mountains of, of Wakanda, and he's looking with him at the sunset. It's a beautiful sunset, and they're looking at it. Um, and as they're looking at the sunset, Killmonger starts to struggle breathing. And so uh, T'Challa, he, he looks at Killmonger, and he just stoops down. And with acceptance in his heart and, and, and with belief in the goodness of this villain, he stoops down and he extends an invitation to community. And he says, maybe we can still heal you. To which Killmonger said, why? So you could just lock me up? Nah. Just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors who jumped from the ship. Because even they knew that, that death was better than bondage. And he pulls the sword out of his chest and he dies right there. Now, why did he do that? Why did he do that? I'll tell you why. Because Killmonger, rather than living by the principle of acceptance, he lived by the principle of rejection. If friends always let you in, Killmonger's approach was, I will let no one in. I'll let no one in. He couldn't see how he could realistically be healed and set free. And so even when he was being offered healing, he opted for death. I think a lot of us are like that. We don't see how we can realistically be healed. So we reject the very thing that God wants to bring into our lives to heal us and to save us. Again, the less you need community, the less you're like God. Community uh, is is. Uh, it comes at an enormous cost, but there can be no supernatural character change without it. Can't be. We have to let people in and we have to receive from people. We have to believe in the goodness of people uh, so that we can get past our reluctance to engage. And when people come into our lives who have a heart posture of maybe we can still heal you, then you have to let them behind the veil. You have to live unfiltered among them so that God can do the critical work of healing in our hearts. Amen. Second, loyalty. Let's look at loyalty for a second. Uh, many of us, we are, approach our relationships the same way that we, we regard our local grocery store, right? Well, we approach relationships this way. We have a consumer relationship with our grocery store, don't we? That, that the reason why we are committed to our grocery store is because it is conveniently located, right? We walk in, you know, they know us, we know them. They say hi, we say hi. We like their products. We like their prices. And so we go there and we're faithful to it. But make no mistake, this is a consumer relationship. Because if a new store pops up, closer in proximity, better products, better prices, buy old grocery store, right? Isn't that how that goes? This is how it goes. And so many of us struggle with community because we have no loyalty. And we're always doing cost-benefit analysis on one another. Am I, am I getting more out of this that I'm putting in? So we think, am, am, are they helpful to me? Can, can they open up doors? Do they have any connections? Or sometimes it's even more implicit than that. Sometimes it's, you know, are you cool enough? Like, like are, you, are you rich enough? Are you, are you smart enough? Are you good-looking enough for me to feel good about myself when I hang out with you? That's how we look at it. Contrast that with David and Jonathan, because three times in their relationship, 1 Samuel chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 20, 1 Samuel chapter 23, three times in their relationship, you see them making a covenant with one another, right? This was an unconditional relationship, and this is how God is putting man and woman back together. This is how God 
is going to put the world back together. It's loyalty. Because Proverbs 18 says this. It says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. See, in community, we stick. That's what community is about. We stick. Uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards, he said it this way, and it's probably one of my favorite quotes of his. He says, if we're never obliged to relieve one another's burdens, but only when we can do it without burdening ourselves, then how do we bear our neighbor's burdens when we bear no burden at all? Jonathan was loyal to David, even to the point of sacrifice. Okay, so that's the the how-to of community. It's acceptance, number one, and number two, it's loyalty. Now, now, how do we do this? How, how do we do this? Uh, how, where do we get the power to do community well? How, how can we be friends and acquire friends? Because that's really hard, right? It, it's, it's really, really hard. If real friendships and real community are about acceptance, always letting people in, right, and loyalty, never letting people down, how do we actually accomplish this? Uh, if you look at Jonathan's life uh, in the, the frame that I gave you, Uh, What you'll notice about him, which is uh, really interesting, is that he was covenantal in all of his relationships. And he was not a consumer. Because on the one hand, uh, he could have uh, very easily been on the side of his father, Saul, and he could have somehow uh, been able to to get David caught up. And what would that have done for him? He could have become king. So if he could have just allowed David to die, he would have been king. But on the other hand, He could have also turned his back on his father, Saul, and he could have given his father up and allowed his father to be assassinated. And then, and this happened all the time in those times, and then he could have become the prime minister. He could have done both, but but it's because Jonathan was absolutely faithful and loyal to both David and his father that he makes a covenant with David in chapter 23 of 1 Samuel. And then right after, he goes into this very ill-advised and foolish military mount on the Mount of Gilboa, and he dies on the battlefield with his father. Does that remind you of anyone? Dying for his father. Dying for his friends. Jesus, right? Jesus himself, as he was preparing to die, this is what he said. He said, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. David was saved through Jonathan's sacrificial uh, friendship, and you and I can only be saved through Jesus' sacrificial friendship. See, friends always let you in and never let you down. Jesus Christ made himself vulnerable to us. His arms are open to us, but, but even more than that, his arms are nailed open. How much more vulnerable and accepting can someone be? If friends always let you in and they never let you down, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, over and over again, he, he referenced how he could call legions of angels down to save him. He knew he had an out. He knew he could get out of it. Jesus was hanging on the cross, and he saw people denying him, betraying him, mocking him, forsaking him. And in one of the greatest acts of love in all of the world, he stayed. He stayed. Jesus stayed on the cross. He is loyal. He is a true friend. And when you see him doing these things, you get a glimpse of the beauty and the depth of his love for you. Becoming vulnerable to you, remaining loyal to you. By doing that, he empowers you to do the same for others. Because now you don't need others to do it for you for you to do it for them. Why? Because Jesus already did it for you. In community, Through acceptance and loyalty, God is putting us back together as a part of his broader plan to put the world back together. And so we're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, I believe there is uh, right here, right now, an invitation from the Lord for someone to respond in faith. Though sin has made you a villain, the, 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 although we are all killmongers, Jesus is right here right now. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, maybe we can still heal you. That's what he's saying. Will you accept the acceptance of the Lord that came at an enormous cost to him? 
And will you respond to the covenantal offer of friendship from the only one who sees you to the bottom and loves you anyway? You know, there's, there's a, a popular saying in our culture right now. I've heard it a lot lately, and it's this. It's, you know, you, you, you'll either die a hero or live long enough to become a villain. Right? You'll die a hero or you'll live a lo- long enough to become a villain. But Jesus is the ultimate of superheroes. Because more than anyone, Jesus died for villains. Jesus died for villains. How did he do that? Because on the cross, he became a villain. He bore the sins of the world on himself in order to save the day. And so again, you may have 99 sin problems, but a savior ain't one. And so if you're here today, you're viewing from your couch, from your kitchen table, from your bedroom, from your laundry room. Why are you watching us from the laundry room? But Okay, I won't judge you. Wherever you are, you're viewing in. Jesus is here for you. Will you respond to the acceptance and the loyalty, the smile of God, the smile from the only one in this world who matters? Will you accept that today? Pray with me. Father, I just thank you. Thank you that you are doing a deep work right now in people. I thank you, God, that this is a message that's going out uh, all over the world. There's others in, in other countries that are peering in right now. We've got friends in other states. We've got friends all over the world that are peering in. And I thank you, God, that, that there is nowhere we can go to get away from your presence. That even now, God, you can go and you can minister to hearts. There is no pit so deep that your love is not yet deeper. And so we thank you for the invitation into community, that that you are are inviting us into this great dance that you've been doing for all eternity. Lord God, you are inviting us into community. There are those of us who have been isolated. We have not, and I just perceive this by the Spirit of God, there are some of us who have not handled shelter in place well. There are some of us who who have not handled not being able to gather on Sundays or not being able to go to work, and we feel cooped up inside and we're raging at family members. Uh, We're we're struggling mightily. But I thank you, thank you, thank you that a relationship with you is the best cure for loneliness because you created us for it. And so, Lord, there are those right now who are really in the valley of decision. They need you. And so I pray that you would give them the boldness, the courage to make that decision, knowing, God, that you did the harder thing by dying for them on the cross. We just thank you, God, for all you're doing. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great week. We are, are very much excited to see you on the devotionals this week and in the various areas that, uh, that we serve the community this week. And we'll also see you next Sunday. God bless.